Um, so yeah, so the next speaker uh, is Rob Sholkoff. Rob Sholkoff is a Sterling Professor of Applied Physics and Professor of Physics at Yale, um, as well as a co-founder and chief scientist of QCI, which is a quantum computing company um, based on superconducting circuits. He did his PhD at Caltech and then did a postdoc at Yale where he stayed to become a professor. He's one of the creators of the field circuit quantum electrodynamics, which has been the basis for quantum information uh, with superconducting circuits. So unfortunately, due to a scheduling conflict, he could not be here in person, uh, but we're really happy that he could be here um, on Zoom. Um, so yeah, he'll be presenting a lecture on superconducting circuits. And Rob wanted to make an announcement that he wants us to be an active discussion. Um, so he encourages questions during it. Um, so the way we're going to do this, there's two microphones there um, where you can go up and ask a question. Um, I'll be looking around and I will interrupt Rob as soon as someone wants to ask a question. Um, or raise your hand and I'll interrupt. And I'll interrupt and then you can come up to the mic and um, ask your question. So yeah, thanks uh, Rob for giving this lecture and we're excited to hear it. Yeah, yeah, great. Um, yeah, I'm sorry I can't be there and go on what sounds like a really nice hike this afternoon, um, but I ended up with uh, having to schedule one thesis defense yesterday and another thesis defense uh, tomorrow. So that didn't leave time to get back and forth to tell you right. Um, so uh, yeah, I, uh, but I'm glad to have this opportunity. Uh, I'm going to try and make this a sort of basic okay. tutorial. And my goal is that if you already know a bunch of stuff about superconducting circuits, you'll be mostly bored, but maybe you'll learn some history and some basics. <laughs> uh, and uh, if you're working in another platform, I hope that I will sort of be able to use some common language of quantum optics and quantum information to kind of explain uh, how we think about these things and uh, what we've kind of done. And um, uh, it's kind of fun to give this uh, uh, lecture. It's uh, almost exactly 20 years to the day uh, from the first time I think I lectured uh, publicly about circuit QED. So uh, we had been thinking about this and uh, 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 talking about it, Steve Gervin and I actually kind of came up with a lot of the concepts even before he moved to Yale, which was, I think, 2001. Um, and uh, it was a rather small team then, but uh, has uh, has grown a lot. And I'll sort of do some uh, now and then to sort of show some of the progression that we see in the field. And, uh, uh, you know, some of the, well, I think it's basically amazing how far it's come. <laughs> At the time, we uh, didn't have uh, we had a lot of cool ideas. We didn't have uh, the idea that it would, uh, concept that it would go as far as it would to uh, reach the stage of kind of uh, early commercialization and thinking about real use cases. So that this is my overview slide that I showed 20 years ago. And we were really excited because we'd already measured a T1 and a T2 and they were on the order of a microsecond uh, uh, in uh, the Cooper pair box, which was sort of the original superconducting qubit that we used for uh, circuit QED. Um, and we were like, hey, can we do strong cavity uh, QED? Um, and we were just starting to think about, uh, you know, what you can do when you're off resonance and in this dispersive regime, which I'll uh, try to explain. Uh, and uh, apologies, I think uh, I was supposed to send these ahead of time. And of course, I didn't think of it until uh, uh, this morning, um, but uh, in this deck, and I also uh, emailed uh, to Jehan, uh, is uh, this sort of a list of um, kind of, yeah, so some selected references. They're uh, both the references and the data I'm going to show are, you know, uh, with apologies, maybe somewhat uh, self centered, but, uh, uh, you know, especially. Uh, for cavity QED, there's this awesome book by uh, Serge Roche and Jean-Michel Raymond. Um, there's a theory paper by Alexander Blay and our team uh, and uh, some of the early uh, experiments. And then uh, the classic references about uh, the transmon qubit that's kind of taken over at least the uh, commercial and the scaling world and a couple of uh, uh, kind of review articles. There are, there are now many, many nice reviews about all this sort of stuff. And also, um, I often point people to the theses, uh, uh, which are available on uh, various group websites, uh, which are often an easier way to understand this stuff than just reading a, a science or a nature paper. 
I'll kind of pause. How, how's the sound? Can you hear me okay? Yep. Great. So uh, I have a lot of slides, but I hope that we don't use all the time or that we get interrupted with questions. Um, this is sort of the program of what I thought I'd uh, tell you or the things that it might be useful to know if you're interested in this uh, in this subfield of quantum information. So uh, I'll do a kind of very simple review of quantum optics and cavity QED. And again, a sort of historically oriented uh, uh, description of circuit quantum electrodynamics and coupling qubits to microwave cavities, uh, the dispersive regime. And if time permits, maybe I'll talk a little bit about the state of the art in uh, error correction and um, a very interesting uh, new thing that uh, we've come across here in the last year or two, which is the dual rail bosonic encoding in superconducting devices. It's really kind of fun, even though it's been 20 years and a lot of the concepts are the same, we're still finding new insights and new ways to do stuff. And like, this is a new qubit where, uh, you know, we get to go back and do all sorts of things, including, you know, really understanding what the noise is, what the decoherence is, what the limits are. And it looks like a really attractive uh, and fast path now for doing, uh, you know, really interesting experiments on quantum air affection and making fault tolerant machines uh, in the near future. So uh, this is a canonical slide. I believe the original graphic with these colors was drawn by Jeff Kimball uh, from Caltech. Uh, and uh, the idea of cavity QED is you have two interesting quantum objects that physicists love. You have a harmonic oscillator and a spin one half. Uh, and we call the uh, oscillator the cavity. Uh, unfortunately, in this field, we use the term cavity, resonator, oscillator, bus, strip line. <laughs> Uh, all interchangeably, but by those we mean the uh, device with uh, sort of microwave quanta of a few gigahertz, but uh, really a linear device that just has the Hamiltonian a dagger A. And then you want some nonlinear element, and of course a uh, two-level system, uh, whether it's an atom or a qubit, uh, is the most nonlinear thing you can get, and it's got its energy scale. And if you can arrange for this uh, uh, qubit or two-level system to have a dipole coupling uh, whose strength is given by this uh, rate uh, G, uh, the so-called vacuum Rabi frequency, you get a sort of uh, energy exchange term where you can swap, if the frequencies match, excitations from uh, the atom into the cavity uh, or vice versa, but do it in a sort of uh, coherent and very uh, and this is your well-known gains coming in with that. Uh, the most interesting thing, and uh, the thing which was a quest in uh, atomic physics for quite some years, was to achieve the so-called strong coupling regime, where uh, this vacuum Rabi frequency exceeds the rates of decoherence. Because in this uh, photon mode here, you could have a uh, loss of photons either out through the ends or scattered or just dissipated if your superconducting oscillator is not perfect. That loss of photons is usually uh, described by the rate kappa. Uh, you can have decoherence, could be T1s and or T2s uh, that are described by some uh, decay rates of the two-level system, gamma. And then when you're doing this with real atoms, there might be some finite interaction time, like when you drop the atoms uh, through, through the mode, although in the modern day, of course, there's two years you can hold things for uh, rather than time. I hear a little bit of chatter occasionally on the line, um, but I'm assuming that I'll really hear it if you want to interrupt me. Okay. Uh, so this is a really lovely kind of uh, simple Hamiltonian um, to kind of illustrate the uh, interesting uh, features or dynamics that this uh, uh, system can have. We can make a uh, energy level diagram. So uh, first, we have to think about the state of the qubit, which could be you know, up or down, or ground or excited state. That's these uh, dimension left and right. Here. And then we have ladders. The qubit can be in its ground state, and then we can have zero or one or two 
or and photons oh. because it's a harmonic oscillator, it's got a uniformly spaced spectrum that just goes out to infinity. And if we can work in the resonant regime, where the frequency of uh, the cavity or the resonator omega r matches the frequency of our two-level system or artificial atom omega a, we would expect to have a degeneracy between uh, the level uh, the levels in the first excitation manifold. So we could have one photon in the qubit in the ground state. Or we could have a uh, vacuum and uh, the qubit in the excited state. And of course, uh, as you generally know, if we have an interaction between two systems that have a degeneracy, there's going to be a level splitting, and it's given by this vacuum Robbie sequence to G. Uh, because of the uh, root N uh, uh, matrix elements of the harmonic oscillator, you'll also have splittings of the second excitation manifold, et cetera, et cetera. But those will have bigger and bigger splittings uh, scaling those square root of n. And uh, what this means is, in the presence of this uh, James Cummings interaction from B, the actual eigenstates of the total Hamiltonian are not going to be excitations of the qubit or of uh, the cavity. They're going to be the symmetric and antisymmetric combinations of having the excitation in the qubit for having the excitation in the cavity. And these uh, you know, are nearly degenerate, but split by 2G. Uh, what that also means is that if we could excite, let's say, the atom and then uh, drop it into the cavity or in some way turn on this uh, resonant interaction, we would prepare uh, the state, let's say, spin up uh, zero or qubit in excited state from vacuum. And then that is not an eigenstate of the total Hamiltonian, and we should see oscillations at a rate given by TG, where after a certain amount of time, we would find uh, actually a photon in the cavity and the qubit in the ground state. But then we would return to the state where uh, the cavity is empty again and the qubit has been re excited. In other words, you can make spontaneous emission now a periodic or unitary process. So this. Uh, atom or artificial atom can emit into this single cavity mode, and then it should coherently reabsorb the same photon uh, and go back and forth. And of course, what that also means is that you can make uh, entanglements and do exchanges of uh, information between these two kinds of uh, atom systems. So uh, one of the best examples of cavity QED in the strong coupling regime uh, it was done with uh, microwave cavities in the sort of tens of gigahertz range and uh, alkali atoms that are prepared in uh, a Rydberg state and then sent as a beam uh, one at a time through this mode. And uh, this was the first observation, I think, of vacuum Navi oscillations in the time domain coming from the filament uh, group. And in this case, what they do is they're probing the interaction with cavity and uh, atom, sending the atom through, varying the amount of time it spins inside the cavity, and then looking at the end at the atomic state. That's enough to sort of infer what went on when the atom was in the cavity. You know, you see here, uh, if we wait a certain amount of time for a half period of vacuum obvious oscillations, the atoms almost always emerge in the ground state, and we assume that there's a photon left in the cavity. Uh, two pi is reabsorbing when you go back to the excited state. And pi over two here would, of course, leave you in a superposition of G and E for the atom with the superposition of both zero and one photons living in the cavity. Uh, in the true optical domain, uh, this is done with uh, uh, mirrors and uh, originally with uh, clouds of atoms that would uh, drop through the mode. And in this case, uh, the typical thing to do is to measure the transmission of the light through the atom, which again gives you information about the combined atom photon system. And uh, back in 2003, 2004, these two versions of atomic uh, strong coupling cavity QED existed. Uh, it was where uh, circuit QED uh, there was a parallel experiment uh, at uh, Delft in the Pacific Point, 
uh, using flux qubits, and uh, then our work uh, uh, with Dr. Andreas Volak with the different box in the same time. Um, there were uh, following up the experiments using semiconductor quantum dots and these kind of uh, infrared uh, multi layer cavities, uh, and uh, things like these little thumb cap uh, whispering gallery cavities. And uh, also around the same time, the ability to track for a reasonable amount of time a single apply item in the uh, waste of this uh, optical cavity in the strong capital region. Any questions so far? Great. So uh, this becomes now a classic uh, uh, picture or the meme for circuit QED. We said, okay, this is a particular sort of uh, idea of how you implement with mirrors and real atoms, this Hamiltonian. But if we believe that uh, superconducting devices like the Cooper Fair Box or other superconducting qubits can act as two level systems, uh, they have excitations in a few gigahertz range. And uh, that means that if we put them together with, let's say, a pattern a strip line resonator uh, that was in frequency range, we could do the same kind of thing. And typically in these experiments, we uh, you know, sort of made a switch from the atom directly to actually just sending in a five or 10 gigahertz radiation uh, microwave signals into this cavity then interact with both the standing wave mode uh, of this strip line and the Cooper Fair box, exit perhaps the hermetic port, and then can be collected naturally. And uh, it was a really fun time to kind of work out the exact correspondence of uh, you know, all the parameters here and show the analogy of the independence. Uh, oops, okay, so some of my old slides I'll see those have some uh, symbols that ran around. So this should just be a uh, a dot file. Uh, the huge advantage of uh, circuit QED is that um, we can have very tight confinement of the fields. Uh, actually, this uh, resonator can be you know, sub wavelength in two uh, transverse dimensions, and of course, only one wavelength this way. Uh, and it has you know very strong electric fields, which means that uh, when interacting with the superconducting qubit. You get uh, a very large uh, vacuum radius interaction. Uh, in the original Cooper Fair Box experiments, you know, one way you can think about it is that that moment is kind of an electron micron uh, rather than an electron einstein. So it's uh, a, a very large transition dipole of one electron moves across this few micron scale superconducting device as you go from ground to solid state. Um, and I think that's even larger than Ludwig atoms. I don't know, maybe Hanazu told you this morning about current state of the art in Ludwig's uh, and uh, they're on the same order that I think about how you can mount that thing. What this means is, you know, sort of cheating to get to the strong coupling regime. We were in the strong coupling regime from day one because the interaction was very strong. So um, in the original experiments, uh, you know, the implementation of the uh, photon mode was, of course, in the microwave and done on chip with superconducting uh, pattern films. Uh, here is a so called CPW strip line where you have launchers that send the microwave signals in. And the meanders are just to get the right electrical length between the first mirror, which is the capacitive gap, and the second mirror, which is this other capacitive gap. This space would be the LC oscillator out uh, at 5 kilohertz with the simple Hamiltonian. And uh, since uh, uh, one Kelvin is about 20 gigahertz, uh, this uh, few gigahertz uh, microwave resonator has a single photon energy of a few hundred millikelvin. So at dilution refrigerator temperatures, you expect the background thermal to, to be very good. Uh, and again, this is a slide that I used 20 years ago. Uh, we were pointing out that this should be a lot of fun because already uh, in other fields like radio astronomy, uh, it was known that you could make on chip resonators like this with Q in the 10 to the 4 or 10 to the 6, uh, not nearly as high uh, as the quality factors of 
approaching kind of the 10 that the microwave rigged out on guys use, uh, but nonetheless quite high. So, you know, these days, <laughs> there are many implementations of this kind of Hamiltonian, this kind of physics uh, sort of scheme we've been using quite a lot at Yale uh, is to actually move to a three dimensional uh, version of this microwave cavity, which allows for even higher cues. Even higher cues, you can get lifetime of a millisecond or cues that are approaching uh, 10 to the 8. Um, and you know, as you may know, also things on qubits have improved their lifetimes from uh, a little bit, you know, a few hundred nanoseconds up to uh, uh, 100 microseconds or, uh, or even more. Um, and you know, we've had sort of been focusing our research quite a bit on a flipped paradigm in which we mostly are interested in using the photon states in these cavities because they have even longer lifetimes than qubits and uh, some other nice properties for it that I talked about at that time. Okay, so uh, just to show uh, some of these results, and maybe I'll try and pick up the pace slightly. Uh, this was, you know, a photo from the original paper in 2004. Uh, we did the experiment, you know, all with microwaves sending the signals through. Uh, we also had some uh, DC flux and active fields that could be applied. Uh, and this is a version of the super connecting qubit that's not used very often anymore called the super the box, although it is really the same thing as a uh, friend of mine, just with a different range for the two important energy scales in Hamiltonian. Uh, Coulomb energy or the charging energy of this island and the Josephson energy for the uh, sort of set by the super current coming through the zero Josephson dimension for these slightly red spots between the two original electrons. Um, and so there you see the dipole moment. We also uh, often say, hey, we don't have to do any atom trapping. Uh, the qubit is just soldered down and we put it in the wrong and it never ever moves. Um, and we can measure these kind of things. Uh, in this field, it's kind of common to say, I measured using one photon. Uh, often what that means is you're using a room temperature generator, which creates a coherent state that is attenuated to a very low power level. Uh, for instance, for a cavity with a quality factor of about 10 to 4, uh, you need about 10 attowatts to create a steady state, coherent state inside this cavity that would have n bar uh, uh, without one or alpha without one. And uh, actually using a combination of superconducting current these days or just uh, uh, semiconducting hydrogen amplifiers that have been used in radio astronomy for quite some time, one can measure uh, quite sensitively the amplitude and the phase and then the signal uh, that will pass through the device. Um, the first uh, observation again of uh, vacuum Rabi splitting is by dropping uh, ampli atoms to the optical cavity. And I saw a one like this uh, in uh, the experiments that Andreas and I did. Uh, this was the original transmission through uh, that microwave cavity. So strong peak because they were coupled uh, at uh, this six gigahertz or so uh, frequency. We could tune the energy levels of the super pair box. And when we brought those into resonance, what we saw was uh, a clear splitting into uh, two separate peaks. Now, uh, an avoided crossing, of course, can be quantum, or even two harmonic oscillators, if you make them resonant, will uh, interact and split into symmetric and anti symmetric states. So, one of the things here is that we could see uh, by driving the system. Uh, that this was really a nonlinear interaction. There were many studies of sort of uh, looking at this uh, James Cummings ladder that is with uh, change and move uh, down that um, followed. And uh, maybe it's fun to just look at some of the parameters. So uh, the original vacuum rod coupling here was about uh, six megahertz or so. Uh, that G was about six megahertz. The vacuum rod frequency about. 12 megahertz already in the strong limit because this peak is basically the symmetric and anti symmetric combination of atom and photon. So they decay at the average decay rates of those two objects that we've created uh, with the avoided crossing is given 
classify this back in multi dimensional. Um, in atomic physics, they talk about kind of critical atom and photon numbers. Uh, when those are less than one, you basically say one photon in the cavity will drive transitions so hard in the atom it will saturate it, uh, or one atom will basically make uh, uh, optical depth of one for that cavity node and be fully absorbent. Um, and uh, uh, you know, this observation is, uh, is a lot of fun. My student, uh, Dave Schuster, pointed out that you can take the words photon and qubit and make interesting combinations. So, uh, you know, here's the rooms of a million photon and qubit, which I don't really use very much. Uh, any questions so far? Uh, so, yeah, things have evolved quite a bit. Um, uh, nowadays, we give a much simpler explanation of how superconducting qubits work because people know they exist. Uh, when we were first doing the qubit box experiment, we used to say, spend most of the talk talking about, you know, this is the Hamiltonian and we really mean it. Um, but uh, the basic idea is all of these superconducting qubits rely on a uh, Joseph's injection, uh, two superconducting electrodes separated by an insulating barrier. We are well below the transition temperature when we use a superconductor with a TC of about one Kelvin, and we expect all the uh, induction electrons to be paired up as Cooper pairs, but uh, with a you know, barrier here, the Cooper pairs can tunnel elastically across the barrier. And this gives us a non linear device, which we hopefully think is dissipation free. I would, by the way, note the Still controversial statement, but we've never proven that the junction inside uh, uh, so the qubits are imperfect or that they're actually limiting uh, the qubits to that. I think there's now some experiments that are suggesting we can actually see the loss in the junction itself, not in the rest of the experiment. Uh, so if you look at this thing, it's a metal insulator, metal sandwich, it's a capacitor. Uh, the Josephson effect is tunneling. Uh, uh, it's currently flowed, but it's not a resistor, it's an inductor. And it's not an ordinary inductor. You have a sinusoidal current phase relationship across the junction. So you get a non linear effect. And you know, to make a long story very, very short and very simple, all you have to do is uh, have the right inductance and capacitance and create something that has a resonance frequency for this oscillator that's in the five to 10 gigahertz range. And uh, if you work in the kind of transmon regime where uh, the Joseph's in the cup of the energy is much larger than the charging energy, you are basically working on something where you have this cosine and solar barrier and several energy levels uh, that fit uh, within this tension. And so when we talk about the spin down and spin up or G and E uh, or F, we usually call the third uh, the third state, second excited state. Um, what we're really talking about is just excitations of this uh, plasma oscillation, this LC uh, circuit, where it's mostly made of uh, junction on uh, those same inductor. Um, kind of a fun thing, but basically, the states of this is, are therefore basically. You know, ground state is vacuum, and the first excited state is one photon, it's one microwave uh, excitation of magnetic and uh, electric fields in this LC oscillator. Um, with about a microvolt in the RMS, about uh, across the junction, um, and uh, rather a small energy, like 10 to the minus 20 characters, but nonetheless much larger than the uh, energy. Um, so, you know, a great advantage of all of these devices is that. We can easily control them if we, uh, you know, some find some way to couple in uh, microwaves that could be resonant with this zero one transition. We could find that and do operations to take us from the ground state to the first excited state in times that are about 10 nanoseconds, uh, and use this as really a two level system or a qubit because this zero one transition frequency in the cosine sort of potential is going to be a few hundred megahertz different than the transition uh, and the resonance condition we would need to continue climbing the ladder for this uh, period. 
And of course, they're superconducting, so they should be good. Um, another thing I like to point out is if you really put in, you know, what we think about uh, as ideal materials properties, you know, aluminum is a BCL superconductor. Uh, we should be able to achieve, you know, cavity and people use like uh, a kind of 50 or maybe 10 to 100, 10 to 100. Uh, so they're really nice, but they're not as good as they're supposed to be. Any questions? So uh, here's a Sorry, can I interrupt you? There's a question here. Oh, great. Yeah. Fire away. Yeah. All right. Hi. Uh, Hi. Yeah. So this is a, a, a bit tangent to. Oh, uh, well. So, so basically, I, I was, I've been wondering, uh, like, what would your view be on uh, an architecture or system with a room temperature superconductor and maybe like with a terahertz uh, uh, you know detection system or a terahertz uh, you know superconducting circuits do, how uh, realistic do you think that <laughs> yes okay this is a this is a uh, a common question um, uh, boy that millikelvin sounds kind of scary uh, and like once upon a time it was, and you had to build your own dilution refrigerators, but as you've probably seen, uh, there are now you know pretty nice commercial systems that you basically just plug into your wall, simple kind of thing, and will you know run for a year at uh, 10 millivolts with a payload of almost a cubic meter. Um, so th there are higher. Uh, we have to work, of course, with frequencies of the qubit that are below the superconducting gap uh, frequency. Uh, and so, indeed, if we use the higher temperature superconductor, whether it's niobium or even like, you know, a cuprate, uh, in principle, we could go to much higher transition frequencies for the qubit. Uh, we'd have to make much uh, smaller circuits, which might be nice, uh, but um, we'd run into all sorts of interesting materials problems and the like. In addition, um, you know, having having originally been a radio astronomer working in the terahertz, um, you can do stuff, but like uh, uh, the connector, you know, there's no connector for terahertz. You're going to be using waveguides and horns. Um, you know, this frequency range is really nice because uh, these days there are quite complicated control systems that we use to drive our multi-qubit uh, experiments or quantum computers. And we're kind of leveraging the fact that there's, you know, uh, quite a big industry driving forward all kinds of very flexible and powerful um, microwave devices and uh, arbitrary waveform generators and the like in this range because Wi-Fi, uh, 5G, uh, etc. So as a guy who's used to 10 millikelvin, I don't see the reason uh, and, and remembers the pain associated with terahertz, I don't see so much the reason to go up there. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? No questions for now. Okay. So, um, yeah, here's a picture of what those original kind of transmons looked like. Uh, I mentioned it's an LC oscillator. It turns out to get into the uh, transmon regime, what you want to do is just make the capacitor really big, which lowers the charging energy. So this interdigitated thing here is just a planar uh, capacitor that's trying to build the sort of hundred femtofarad capacitance. And at the heart of it is uh, one, or in this case, there was a little squid loop at two junctions, so you could tune it using current through this little control line uh, that's a couple hundred nanometers on the side. And you just have aluminum, you grow a thin few nanometer barrier by uh, aluminum oxide in the chamber and uh, and you can have this sort of finger overlap. So the junction is point down through here, up and down through the area, uh, and watch you for it. And you know, why is the transform uh, so predominant? Well, it's uh, it's kind of simple. It has the, you can make it with one layer of uh, lithography. Uh, it's only got one capacitor and one junction. Um, and especially the important thing about the transmon is. The states are these states which are just um, you know, zero or one uh, microwave quanta oscillated in this uh, device. 
if we uh, put this thing, you know, in a ground plane and shield it electromagnetically, it really can't radiate. And there's no way that you can distinguish these two uh, uh, qubit states by, let's say, uh, uh, a charge moving around or an external magnetic field or things like that. So it basically uh, got no DC properties that you can control. And so uh, it has no kind of low frequency one over F noises that can come in and, and bite you. And uh, yeah, so many, many people have uh, kind of adopted this. It's not the only super that can do that. There's still a by the way of research around, you know, what are the fancier things you can do with more junctions and more other circuit element, uh, other circuit elements. And, and you know, in principle, you can make a wide variety of artificial atoms. You have all kinds of interest in spectra and, and people can and do it, uh, can and do do it. Uh, but if you're going to try and build a hundred of them, uh, we'll have experiments where you're concentrating on other things than just making the qubit. Turns out to be pretty nice thing to use. And um, with uh, sort of improvements in the transmon from those original experiments, uh, this is what we could kind of do in 2008. This is the same vacuum Robbie's putting, where now the uh, separation is a few hundred megahertz, uh, and the uh, coherence times have gone up to the point where this uh, uh, so called cooperativity is 10 to the 5 or 10 to the 6. And if we go to the real state of the art uh, with kind of 3D cavities, you know, again, we have a uh, vacuum Robbie splitting that's a uh, hundred sort of megahertz, let's say, uh, a dispersive interaction chi that I'll talk about in a minute. It's sort of on the order of uh, uh, an inverse uh, microsecond. Uh, and you can have lifetimes of the transmine and cavity in the sort of hundred microsecond to millisecond range. And so, you get uh, kind of amazing numbers for this uh, cooperativity. You are very, very deeply in the strong uh limit. Um, this is sort of the challenge, uh, the benefit and the challenge of superconducting circuits. They want to interact much more strongly than atoms, which means it's hard to prevent peak coherence. And it's also hard when you make a complicated circuit or computer to get the off state where things are not coupling to each other. Getting a strong coupling to do a gate really fast is not a high Okay, uh, so uh, another important piece of physics which is used all the time in this field is the dispersive limit of uh, cavity or circuit Q to B. So I mentioned, uh, this is from the original paper again, but I mentioned if you tune the qubit frequency down uh, and it comes close to the cavity frequency, which is sort of a point of the gigahertz, when they are uh, resonant with each other, they would collide if you have this avoided crossing. However, if you uh, sit, you know, at some detuning uh, away, there is still a level repulsion of uh, these two uh, systems because there's still a, a, a second order or off resonant uh, interaction. And this uh, dispersive uh, interaction is, you know, used even more often than the, than the resonant uh, in this. So, if uh, you go to your cavity QED textbooks or uh, we return to these dressed state ladders, again, we have kind of ground state and excited state, uh, zero, one, two, and zero, one, two, both times. If we now have, oops, uh, so we have a little drift in notation. We now have the uh, transition frequency of the qubit, omega zero, one that is close to, but not equal to the frequency of the resonator. Uh, we have this uh, detuning delta between the two. So uh, here the excitation of the qubit takes a little bit more energy than the excitation of the photon. Uh, like I said, there's still an interaction. There are still new eigenstates, which are dressed states that combine a little bit of uh, qubit and cavity. Uh, this is uh, what they're given by. And um, it also means that these two states kind of inherit a little bit of the uh, peak coherence, uh, gamma or kappa, uh, and kind of that way. But if you make uh, this detuning large compared to the vacuum Robbie splitting, the sort of mixing angle between the two is small. You have uh, kind of almost qubit states and almost cavity states. Um, where, uh, for instance, the qubit should only suffer uh, a uh, 
decoherence contribution from proton loss in the cavity that goes as uh, G over delta squared. And so if you have it be tuned by a factor of 10 or something here, you would have a lifetime 100 times longer of the qubit than of the cavity, even more if there's sort of a virtual image around it. Um, that's the sort of hybridization of the proton effect. And in this regime, uh, you get a really cool thing. You have, again, your uh, uh, harmonic oscillator, you, have your egg. you still have our qubit or two uh, level system, and we have an interaction uh, which now changes from being uh, the James Cummings interaction where you exchange energy between the two to a dispersive uh, Hamiltonian where the interaction now uh, has a second order dependence on the coupling strength. Uh, and it takes the form of just A dagger A times sigma D. And um, I like to call this uh, uh, a doubly QMD uh, interaction. You see, basically, it's an energy energy interaction. If we excite the cavity and A dagger A changes, it shifts the energy of sigma D, but it doesn't change its state. And simultaneously, or conversely, if we excite the uh, uh, qubit, we might change the uh, excitation energy it takes to add to the cavity. And in this limit, the sign of sort of strong dispersive coupling is that the second order interaction, d squared over delta, is going to be larger than all the sources of dissipation. And there you should see something called uh, the proton numbers. Now, you can also use this interaction, and this is done basically in almost every experiment these days, uh, you use this dispersive interaction as a measurement tool. If you couple uh, your qubit to a uh, cavity, and we again think about looking at the transmission spectrum of sending microwave signals through that cavity, you'll have a different frequency uh, uh, for the qubit in the ground state uh, than the cavity you have in the excited state. And um, for instance, if you probe uh, at a frequency here in between the two, uh, we expect to see, uh, we expect to see uh, a phase shift that can be measured on that microwave signal. We can use this dispersive interaction to basically perform uh, QMD uh, hyperdelity measurement uh, on the qubits. Um, and, uh, um, these days, you can do amazing uh, high quality measurements. Uh, if you would weakly drive one of these qubits and you make this dispersive measurement, it's projecting the qubit to decide whether it's in the ground state or the excited state. And you can make high signal to noise here, watching your time. Uh, these are similar time cases with wrap on things where the transition occurs now in the So this is. Uh, up observing the quantum jumps of an average atom uh, and observing those jumps for the uh, protons and cations, of course, was uh, uh, Nobel Prize given for social relation. Uh, uh, so, um, the other thing you can do is instead of thinking about this dispersive interaction as uh, changing uh, in cavity. Uh, or the photon energy spectrum, you can think about the photon number then to et cetera as changing the frequency of the qubit. You see here, if I write the interaction like so, to cause a change in sigma z, I have to have the original energy plus something proportional to the value. And uh, that means that if you now look at like, the absorption spectrum of the qubit, you should see peaks. Uh, equally spaced, which correspond to the uh, number of photons, zero, one, two, three, and four, and so. So, this is the so called proton number splitting regime, which is really only thing to observe observed in uh, microwave uh, cavity QED and the um, you know, Again, these days, what you can do is have incredible amounts of splitting. Uh, this uh, dispersive interaction can be several megahertz. And magnets can be in less than 100 hertz to a few kilohertz uh, range. So uh, we are split by many, many magnets. And what it means now is you can kind of separately address uh, not only the transitions between G and E of the transon, 
but the transition between ground and excited state is determined by if you were in the vacuum state of the cavity, or if you were in any phase one over right here, or any phase two. Uh, and like I said, you can do all kinds of cool measurements with this. For instance, imagine sending a pulse to the device uh, at uh, this frequency, where we use narrow band enough that it will only excite this transition and not uh, the n equals zero or n equals two transition. If I do that for the right amount of time uh, to sort of institute a pi pulse and the transmon, and then I measure the transmon state through some other uh, means, if I see the transmon in the excited state, it means that there must have been one photon left. Uh, and so we can do things like this where depending on the frequency we send in, we can do interesting cavity qubit conditional uh, operations if the cavity is in N and we select the N by picking the frequency, uh, sending frequency with that pulse, uh, we then can read down the excited state on the thin turn uh, and um, find out what the flight time number is. And you get a click that basically says, yes, I have one, or no, I have no ones. Uh, uh, and so here's an example of using that. Um, sadly, this is a Data that we never thought we'd but uh, if we create a coherent state with, say, uh, an average of seven photons in one of these batteries, and then perform uh, uh, one of these photon number selected measurements, of course, a coherent state has an average uh, photon number of seven, but there are probabilities of finding it in various different photon numbers. And so, for instance, in this case, oops, uh, or in this case over here, we've done a pi pulse on the n equals six peak, and I post selected only the data where we got a click or uh, found the trend line in the excited state, and then we proceeded to measure this is actual data, measure the Wigner function of the resulting cavity state, and uh, if you can count the six rings here, the uh, fact of answering yes has converted the uh, Indetermined, undetermined number of uh, photons in that coherent state into a number state or a box state with exactly six photons. Um, can I interrupt you quickly for a question? Yeah, please go ahead. Give me one second. Hi, so I had a question on the slide where you mentioned the state of art measurement. So I, I didn't hear well on like what was the like interesting idea that allows that a uh, higher measurement fidelity. You mentioned quantum jump, but I, yeah, oh yeah, I sorry, uh, maybe went a little too quickly there. So um, what uh, you can do in uh, uh, this kind of a measurement, if I send a constant tone to the cavity of this frequency, uh, then uh, there will be sort of Either uh, I either find the cavity uh, with its frequency below my probe plane or above my probe plane. So I'll get a this sort of uh, two value uh, phase shift or amplitude of the microwave signal that's going to come through. And if I really leave that on uh, constantly, I am all the time asking the transmitter, are you in G or are you in P? And so uh, a QND measurement. Uh, uh, what does that mean? It means that I'm making a measurement in a certain uh, uh, eigenstate basis of whatever system it is I'm making. If I prepare one of those two eigenstates, I should never be confused. So if you say, hey, look, this time trace in the black thing here, it's been like this blue value for a really long time. The transmon must absolutely be in D or spin down. And the next measurement then is going to always find the same value, uh, the same eigenstate. Uh, same thing for the red trace, this part up here. Uh, of course, if we have a superposition uh, of up and down or G or E, uh, that can exist. But if I have this probe terminal on, I'm always asking the question, are you G or E? Heisenberg says our superposition cannot live. And so uh, the quanticity here, right, is that there's uh, no superposition, you're sort of destroying the coherence, 
by the act of measuring. Uh, but you can still have sort of incoherent weak transitions uh, that go back and forth. So um, I don't know if this is covered in other parts of the school. Uh, people use this term QND and they very often misuse it. And they say, but it's, it's not non-demolition. If I have, uh, you know, uh, alpha zero plus beta one, I get zero with probability alpha squared and one with probability beta squared. Yes. That's a quantum measurement. Uh, but the cool thing is that you can measure many times. And so we can get very high fidelity here, you, you see, because uh, for a long time, the qubit persists in uh, a certain state, and we can acquire a very high uh, sigma to noise ratio. Did that help? Yeah, I think so. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. And then I think there was one more question. Okay, go for it. Okay, thanks. Um, yeah, was, so you were explaining to us how you can measure a FOX state and it looking at those Wigner function plots made me wonder if you could also explain how do you, yeah, how do you actually obtain these? Do you just- Ah, yes. Um, thanks. It's, uh, it's all done with the transmon and the dispersive interaction. <laughs> so uh, what you can do is uh, basically create a superposition so, so after we first do this measurement, we we find a click. We actually recycle the transmon. So if we if we find E, we've measured it. We know it's in E. We reset it by performing a pi pulse conditionally because our electrons can know that. And then if you uh, do a pi over two pulse and create a superposition, now uh, the uh, frequency of that transmon is again shifted by the photon number that's in the cavity. And if you wait the right amount of time, you can uh, arrange things such that, uh, let's say, you will acquire a pi phase shift if and only if the photon number is odd. But if the photon number is even, zero, two, four, whatever, you will get uh, an integer multiple of two pi as the phase shift kind of thing. And to then sort of finish a Ramsey experiment by doing another pi over two pulse and measure the transmon, effectively performed a single shot measurement, not of the photon number, but of the parity of the photon. And that, for different displacements here in the IQ plane, is essentially the definition of the good So uh, this, yeah, it's another way in which this displacement interaction is really uh, quite powerful. Sorry, I have slides to explain that, but it would be too many. Okay, uh, so let's see. Um, I want to leave maybe 15 minutes for questions, but I think also the charge here was to give a little bit of a feel for uh, uh, these systems as platforms. Uh, you know, obviously, it's an amazing platform for doing quantum optics that you couldn't do with real atoms, uh, also for doing um, all kinds of interesting things in quantum measurement uh, that you can think of but are often difficult to implement in the real world. Uh, but of course, the ability to control and manipulate the state of these transmon qubits and to uh, utilize microwaves for classical microwave signals and quantum microwave signals to uh, interact with them means you can do uh, lots of things in terms of building interacting qubit systems uh, that can be programmed as computer. And so, one of the first things and the, the uh, apparatus that we use to do the first quantum algorithms in superdimensional circuits is uh, to basically extend this concept. Let's say I have my uh, strip line resonator and I put uh, two of these transmodal qubits uh, inside the same resonator. I can still send microbes to at least my kind of uh, Now, um, I will have, uh, again, uh, a single oscillator mode, but I'll have two uh, different uh, film -film frequencies and other different atoms. And if I put them at different locations inside this cavity, they will both have a vacuum Rabi or dipole interaction with that uh, shared uh, oscillator mode uh, of this strip line they'll have an interaction that looks like two versions of the James Cummings uh, uh, kind of thing. 
And what's pretty cool about this is that you can uh, arrange to have this interaction even if these two transmines are, let's say, at opposite ends of the trip line, which might be a, a centimeter line. And you can also, and this is what's done in you know, most of the computers, you can also just have a direct capacitor that we cover the two uh, transmines. But then, of course, you're only going to be able to build nearest neighbor pipelines uh, for these kind of groups. Uh, so, uh, so you can do really neat things here. You can do multiplex readout because depending on the state of this uh, transmon and this transmon, you will now have two discrete frequency shifts of this uh, readout resonator that goes between. Uh, they each exhibit this dispersive pole. Uh, uh, squared over delta. Um, but also, uh, both of the qubit states are going to be shifted if we put an excitation uh, in the cavity. And, and again, you have sort of this uh, tens of nanoseconds interaction time and principle. Um, you know, uh, these days you can do uh, you know, perhaps uh, several hundred or a thousand uh, entangling operations between these uh, elements. And so, uh, this is a picture of the First multi transmon device, I think. Uh, you see very much the same kind of scheme. Uh, we put you know, microwave control signals at the two distinct frequencies of this uh, artificially <laughs> red and blue colored uh, transmons uh, that they're part here. Um, we also have the ability, again, with these uh, little magnetic uh, flux control line to uh, tune the uh, frequency of the transmon. And then look at the microwave signal that comes on it. It's simple to uh, And when you do spectroscopy on the uh, if you look at the transmission through uh, the cavity, it has a particular frequency. And then uh, at some point, as one is changing this control knob or tuning uh, one of the qubits here, it will come down and have kind of very crossing. This is the same. Back in now be putting one of the qubits with the capital. You can also do spectroscopy to see when you excite either the uh, left chart or right chart. Uh, and for instance, if I tune one of the qubits but not the other, they will eventually have an avoided crossing. Uh, sorry, uh, they will eventually come into resonance with them, and they will also have uh, an avoided crossing. Where does that avoided crossing come from, given that the qubits are so far apart and don't have any direct electrical interaction with each other? Well, uh, it comes from uh, a kind of dispersive interaction. So uh, there's an interaction strength here, which looks like a flip flop exchange interaction between uh, the blue and the white qubits. I can, at this point right here, uh, the Hamiltonian allows me to swap an excitation from uh, the red qubit into the blue qubit at a rate given by G1, G2 over delta. What is that? It's uh, a swap of the qubits through uh, a virtual proton interaction. In other words, uh, this uh, qubit, which is not resonant with the battery, can virtually excite one excitation here, which will shift the frequency of this qubit. And vice versa. And so you get this kind of flip flop in action with the one link, opposite on bus. And um, with this kind of uh, system, we could measure both of the qubits, we could control independently both of the qubits. Uh, we could turn interactions on and off in this particular scheme. Uh, basically, just by changing delta, this interaction is always on. But at this point, uh, delta is at the gigahertz, and at this point, delta goes to zero. So uh, and you know, one could build a very simple uh, algorithm. I think we call this a processor, not a computer. But anyway, you could do single qubit operations, uh, conditional, unitary, or entangling gates like a C naught or a C phase. And uh, you know, we did uh, as we joke that we make it. We did all the algorithms you can do with this system because there are two. <laughs> Uh, 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 program that you can um, And, you know, a nice thing is we could also sort of do full state tomography on the system, uh, showing how you feel the bad story and how you. Uh,
interfere uh, with the state to uh, make the probability uh, peak at a particular output in the computation of races of the two qubits, uh, which gives you the answer to your, your question. Uh, what is the particular uh, phase in interaction by the qubit? Quantity of time scale. Um, and you know, things have obviously progressed a huge uh, uh, way from there. Uh, this was uh, 2008 or so. Um, you know, in the years since, we've seen uh, a lot of uh, uh, commercial organizations standing up, uh, building these kinds of things. Many of these, but not all of these uh, frames, are basically doing you know multi qubit versions of. Uh, twin bonds and the like with you know very elegant uh, and difficult engineering but kind of uh for incremental or straightforward and uh extrapolations of things. And you know you can have amazing things. Uh single qubit operations can be three or four nines, meaning you can do uh thousands of them before you would have a deep overland again. Two qubit interactions are not bad, but they're in the sort of one uh, percent or a little bit less than one percent uh, area, and um, unfortunately, these machines, as impressive as they are, don't yet achieve uh, what we call common advantage, where you do a computation you wouldn't otherwise know the answer to, uh, or uh, nor is the performance uh, good enough to get us to uh, be able to realize our tolerance where we have a uh, successful and kind of scalable quantum particle. Uh, one measure, it's not the only, but one measure of sort of how good you're doing on a computation is the so called uh, quantum volume. Uh, the volume is the number of dimensions of your Hilbert space you can access. So, you know, think of it very loosely as the number of parallel possibilities you could be exploring in your algorithm. Um, it's two to the number of qubits that you can entangle. But you can imagine that if I have a uh, 1% failure rate, if I had, say, 10 qubits and I wanted to really do something non trivial to them, I may need 10 gates, which means I will, I will pretty much always have a 50% of the time. And so I think for super nothing qubits, the current record is at 512. That's about nine qubits. So I like to make the joke that IBM's computers are uh, 10 to 100 times bigger than those figures. Since you can really only use one of them. There's a whole field of error and mitigation and exploration of you know, whether there's information you can gain from this very noisy output. So from the few shots that have actually succeeded. Yeah, I see it's a very noble question. Cool. So let me do one other uh, thing very quickly and just talk a little bit about error correction and uh, the thing that's been the theme of our research for the last eight or 10 years, uh, which is really trying to figure out how to do error correction efficiently. And uh, what we've kind of come to is we realize that uh, uh, there's a much better way if you flip the paradigm and search the QB and use horizontal qubits, that is to say, Use the uh, longer lived and better performing cavities as the information carriers on the trans lines, simply as we saw, like in the sort of bullseye picture, as the uh, detectors and manipulators of those kinds of states. So, um, error correction is uh, a very beautiful idea. It was also uh, discovered by Peter Shore, uh, you know, within a year of. Uh, 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 Putting forth the factor in algorithm. Uh, if I only have one kind of error in my cube, uh, let's say it's bit flips and a zero can flip to a one, I can create what's called a logical cube uh, that still has one bit of information, i.e., two complex samples with alpha and beta. If I can create, if you do with a simple circuit composed with single qubit gates and one of those two qubit entangling gates like a CMA. If I can create a state of three qubits that is, let's say, alpha zero 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 plus beta one one one. So I redundantly encode my information here in uh, an entangled state of three qubits. 
uh, and uh, a problem with this is uh, well, it costs money uh, and time and effort to uh, make our qubits. So uh, uh, using three of them to only encode one bit of information is um, a little bit of a setback. But also there is an inherent overhead in doing error correction. So you see now we are going to be robust to both order to these bit flips. But uh, we also have three qubits, each of which can suffer an error. So uh, in fact, the mean time between errors is going to be uh, three times shorter. Uh, we're going to lose before we go. Um, it's even worse than that because we can't do a simple repetition code uh, or the quantum version of uh, plastic error correction because qubits not only have bit width, but also phase widths. And so you need a larger system. Uh, uh, the best known one, uh, perhaps, is the so called surface code, where if you have, uh, let's say, a grid of three by three, here I'm showing a grid of five by five, where the white dots are qubits that are used in an ended state to uh, hold one bit of quantum information. To, uh, Faces who have a central qubit, which is measuring four body and entangling operation and uh, stabilizes on those bright dots to tell us about the orders. And this two dimensional thing can correct in principle for any kind of poly error, any combination of bit bits and bit bits. Uh, and the way this works is if you can really make scalable error correction. Uh, we have a certain probability of physical errors occurring on our byte uh, individual qubits. There's a so called threshold error probability. Uh, and if our errors are lower than this threshold error probability, the act of measuring on uh, these quantities, and there are nine quantities or nine statewide we get to measure in the three by three uh, here because there's nine data qubits. Um, that must be eight so that eight uh, double two bits. Um, and uh, that would give us distance three, which would protect us against a single bit or phase bit and reduce the probability of errors from uh, P physical to a number that uh, is decreased by the ratio of like this uh, and ways to the P over P. Um, a nice thing is that uh, you can theoretically calculate the so called threshold. For this kind of thing. That's a population that is agnostic to your platform and that kind of qubits you're using. Um, and uh, you find that uh, uh, for most kinds of errors, the threshold is around the percent, which is where we're almost at. Uh, but if you can move really to a physical error rate, which is much below the so called threshold, then this number here becomes much less than one. And you gain exponentially as you increase the amount of redundancy or the distance of your error. Um, so, this is the approach that many people are taking. Let's say we can just scale up to 50 or 100 qubits, and then if we can also make them have a uh, point line of 0.01% errors, we can be past this threshold and uh, very stuff. Um, and the problem is we're, we're not really past the threshold in general. And as you scale things up, it typically gets worse. Uh, a recent experiment by Google that showed the operation of a distance three and a distance five qubit, but they were losing ground. They had an overhead, and then they're still not making up even the overhead. Now uh, reaching the break even like that. So in this uh, Yale bosonic qubit strategy, we sort of take a different point of view. We're going to correct first by having a different physical gadget. Uh, and then scale. We want to do this in a way that takes less parts and will have lower overhead built in uh, cost, graduate student agony, uh, and also uh, the overall rate of which errors are there. We're going to use a system like the cavity, which has a longer lifetime, so slower errors, but also has predominantly only single photon loss. There's no phase shifts in that. In that and then make something which is distance three or first order correction at the hardware level. And if we can do that, and I think we've shown now uh, a variety of experiments in which uh, this can really work, uh, then 
the idea here is that we should take our physical error probability and square it, that's what distance three gives you, before we put it into one of the traditional codes and start concatenating that piece of distance. And so that means if we have today's performance, that we can square the error rate first before scaling, we can go from 1% to 0.01%. And um, by the way, then if everybody doubles their lifetime or increases their gait fidelity by a factor of two, this approach would scale four times faster rather than two. Okay, so um, the way we do that is using multi photon states like these cat states in a cavity. The photon number parity that we uh, asked about in our I described earlier is basically the error syndrome because if you store information in these two states, uh, they have an indeterminate photon number, but both of these two logical states have even photon number quality. If you lose a photon, regardless of which logical state you are starting in, you're going to be in the higher And you could do that uh, and run this as an actual real time error correction system. And we incurred an overhead of about a factor of three again. Because we used on average several photons or uh, out there in the spray three or so uh, for our pastors. Um, but we could operate this machine and using the information we gathered, get just about back that factor. And I believe this bosonic approach is still the only error correction approach to reach break even. There's been a few uh, experiments following after uh, the first one uh, in my lab in 2016. There was some uh, really cool stuff using fancier multi photon codes like the D3P, and the recent experiments here in Michelle Devereux's group has uh, reached about a factor to pass for people. Uh, and I should probably end there, but um, I just wanted you know, to mention you know, that I'm also a founder of PCI. Uh, we have a recent paper on the archive that's a direct collaboration between uh, my group. With Steve Gordon and Kiki Curry, uh, and the team at uh, UCI and Circuits Inc. Uh, on a new kind of bosonic cavity, the so called dual uh, qubit. And um, this qubit has some really amazing uh, properties we think. The concept and the way we do gates and things uh, we were uh, put up on the archive just recently. The first experiments on this were put uh, up on the archive a few weeks ago. It's a sort of the simplest version of a bosonic error correction code, um, which actually relies on error detection. And it's kind of described that very briefly. Uh, for me, this dual rail encoding is kind of the transmon simplifying moment for error correction. You know, with the transmon, we had all these fancy kinds of qubits, and it turned out there was a much simpler one which solved nearly all the problems and didn't seem to cost you very much in any uh, particular way. Uh, and uh, this dual rail encoding seems to be kind of the same thing. It has a really neat hierarchy of error rates. Uh, you know, most of the errors are only one type, and then uh, other kinds of errors are extremely rare, which means we can be much more efficient at uh, correction. Um, and it, it really looks like it achieves this goal of squaring the fidelities to give you a two order of magnitude gain. So we can do now uh, single qubit operations in this uh, system. At about four nines, two qubit gates uh, take about a microsecond uh, and are uh, being performed today. And you can use a cool trick called error collection, sorry, error erasure conversion uh, to plug into the usual error collection codes. And uh, we can get you know, two orders of magnitude or so past the factor. And the way this uh, thing works in brief is we're going to use two cavities. So there is some physical overhead or redundancy required. And just one photon, either in the left cavity or on the right cavity, uh, as the uh, zero and, uh, and the logic. This has, of course, the minimum number of excitations. Um, and uh, only one thing that can happen you can lose the photon, whether you're in the left cavity or the right cavity, and go to the vacuum. And notice again here that the uh, logical uh, states, whether they are uh, zero or one or any superposition always contain exactly one photon between the core of the cavities. That is, odd photon number means a valid code uh, rate, and anything that's decayed or heated out of that space is going to have even photon number 
which is really fun. And um, you know, you can only see some really amazing things in this computing. Um, you get redundancy in measurements, so you can obtain uh, so called spam uh, or uh, logical assignment errors in a single shot that are from the 10 to the minus 4 to 10 to the minus 5 range. And you can measure that uh, things like the get to a flight time are uh, uh, between sort of a tenth of a second and a few minutes. Um, the main uh, error process here being the sort of purple thing, which is halfway down that's very ratio. Um, so I should really leave a little bit of time for questions. So um, let me just uh, thank everyone uh, involved and uh, uh, see if you have any other questions. Thanks. Thanks for a really great talk. Uh, so now um, I'll open the floor if there's any questions or discussions. Uh, maybe I will start off with something. So today's um, uh, set of talks are on experimental platforms. Uh, so I was wondering if you can comment on potential like uh, bottlenecks of like scalability uh, with superconducting circuits, or yeah, if you give give some insight on. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, you you mean really on the kind of uh, system engineering side. <laughs> So uh, sure. that's really the kind of thing which is uh, the main uh, area of effort for uh, commercial organization. And, and uh, although to scale up and do a more complicated experiment, uh, and, uh, but even the also have to be some So, um, you know, there are, uh, I'm sure I have a good image to use for this. Um, and there, there are many, uh, uh, Aspects that one uh, uh, needs to worry about, and uh, any sort of aspects that uh, you have to worry about. So, for building the control system, um, biogenics is now a pretty standard and pretty reliable um, ingredient. Uh, you know, there are advantages in this microwave control versus. Um, uh, uh, lasers. I mean, I guess everyone uh, prefers the devil they know to the devil they don't know. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, one interesting aspect uh, that comes up often is the sort of size. So if you're going to scale to a million qubits, how big is this damn thing going to be? So um, superconducting qubits are pretty big. Uh, and um, you know, they're typically millimeters uh, on a side. Uh, you know, this whole thing here is uh, like a centimeter. And as you see, it could contain, uh, uh, you know, four or six uh, qubits and the like. Um, I predict that you're never going to see qubits, uh, super millimeters getting really, really small, like we've done with CMOS, because the smaller you make them, the more they interact with the surfaces and other microscopic impurities, and that's actually bad. Uh, also, it's hard to wire them up and kind of decouple them. So, um, you know, you can have enormous dilution refrigerators, and people are building them. Uh, and, you know, if you pack these things in the right way, uh, you can fit an awful lot of them uh, together. I think there's always going to be a limit uh, how big an individual processor can be. It's probably how many you can fit in sort of this size. <laughs> um, but uh, another really neat aspect of uh, superconducting circuits is, of course, you know, uh, we can build devices where on demand we can essentially convert our standing qubit into uh, a photon in this cavity or into a flying qubit that goes out on a superconducting transmission line. And superconducting coaxes or transmission lines have a sort of 3 dB loss in one kilometer. Uh, and so you can easily wire up many uh, modules uh, in a future superconducting computer, even all within one cryogenic space or you know, with tunnels between multiple refrigerators. So I, I just don't really think space or size is going to be the thing. It's um, it's complexity, <laughs> and material science is one of the ways that it's uh, improved, but. Um, you know, it's just learning how to engineer these things. So I, I don't really see any fundamental limits to what you can scale to. And 
And you know, I'm not an expert enough on the other platforms to say exactly how it could line up against those. Great, thanks. Um, we have one question here. So I have a question on the dual rail encoding. Yeah, sure. My understanding is some of some groups do dual rail with the cavities and some do dual rail with transmons. Could you comment on like advanced yeah, this, yeah. Uh, just differences? Right. So yeah, there was an interesting uh I guess independent discovery of this idea by uh Amazon uh doing it with transmons. I think the real reason. Uh, for us to use the dual rail. Uh, in this scheme, we uh, can essentially, um, we essentially have different classes of errors. So uh, photon loss from the cavity or other things that go wrong with the transmon during gates can be detected on the fly and they're erasures. Those are really good to uh, uh, error correct. They have a much higher threshold. The thing you don't protect against in either of these transmon or cavity schemes is uh, phase dips of the qubit. And so in our uh, cavities, we know that this time is at least 10 milliseconds. And uh, we only ever really gotten a bound. Um, I expect that this phase lifetime could be seconds or longer. Um, so, we, you know, the transmon approach is kind of cool. They were clever where they can do a first order suppression of some of the phase flips. But I think uh, uh, I prefer the cavity version because it's going to be able to uh, you know, kind of utilize this uh, uh, this long inherent phase flip like that. Sort of the best way so far we've come up with to uh, leverage the benefits or the strengths of the uh, micro cavity. But you know, it's, uh, it's, it's very interesting. This, this idea you know, that drives the dual rail in part right, is the idea of um, being able to detect the ratios on the individual qubits. That is uh, something uh, which uh, has also now uh, really started with neutral atoms and uh, is uh, starting to crop up in lots and lots of different platforms. So, you know, as there was with uh, quantum optics and other things, there's a lot of cross fertilization even between. Uh, platform. So I think we're entering a really interesting era for quantum error correction, where rather than the theorists talking about the end and goes to infinity codes and the experimentalists talking about how I can do five things, now we actually kind of overlap and we learn how to tailor the performance and uh, particular errors and uh, operation types and everything of the qubits to better enable a code, which can also be optimized uh, to the structure of the errors and what uh, you can do uh, in the qubits. And you know, when you start doing that kind of optimization, you, know, you suddenly find, oops, there's orders of magnitude to uh, wins that can be done. So uh, I think you'll see a lot more of this kind of discovering different types of logical encodings. Uh, any other questions? Oh, over here. Yeah, thank you very much for the talk. Um, in the context of uh, quantum simulation, I guess, it's interesting to couple the uh, qubits directly, and that's one of the advantages that there is in ion traps. I don't get the impression that you always couple the qubits directly or the transmons in this platform. So what are the limitations and would that be easy? What's the problem to that? Right, right. Um, okay. Yeah, uh, you know, of course one can do uh, simulations in uh, these kinds of platforms. Um, uh, you know, you can couple transmons directly uh, and, you know, for uh, many of the processors, they're either, you know, rings of connected uh, qubits or two-dimensional grids. Um, you know, another thing you can do with this uh, superconducting circuits, of course, is you can do bosonic simulations. So one can couple together multiple cavities uh, and, uh, you know, do things like uh, boson sampling, whether it's Gaussian or conventional. Um, and, you know, you can do direct simulations of uh, bosonic dynamics. So, uh, you know, figuring out how to leverage 
uh, when you want, you know, more two level like uh, devices or more bosonic like devices is a topic uh, that is part of the center that we have uh, uh, with um, Brookhaven National Lab and, uh, um, you know, I think more and more people are kind of looking at uh, uh, that aspect. You know, there's an interesting thing for quantum simulation that a qubit is really neither a fermion nor a boson. And so creating the encoding that really acts like the fermion or the boson uh, imposes already a certain overhead in your uh, quantum simulator. Yeah, so sorry, and maybe I'll just rephrase because I think maybe I wasn't uh, very clear. I just wondered experiment exactly relating to the issues that you were just discussing. Uh, experimentally, what are the limitations on coupling the transmons directly in the platform? So you want to make some kind of bosonic quantum simulation, use the bosons, also use the transmons. But if you directly want qubit qubit coupling, uh, you know, is that I, I was under the impression that you don't often couple them directly. And so why not? Uh, is that an issue or could you um, them? Yeah, no, I guess I don't have a great picture for that. Uh, 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 you, you know, uh, I think there is a subgroup of superconducting qubits, uh, uh, which includes us, that sort of prefers to focus on the uh, uh, cavity first <laughs> version of uh, connecting things. But, um, you know, in the uh, sort of canonical surface code uh, on chip things that people are making, they either have direct capacitive couplings between the qubits, uh, where you know transmon is each one of these vertices, or they have um, other tunable transmon devices that you hope don't get excited, but turn couplings uh, on and off between them. So, you know, one is able to do all to all if you would fit them all along a single transmission line. That would be the direct analog of an ion spring, uh, or you can do, you know, all qubits with tunable couplings, or you can do uh, networks or grids of uh, bosonic cavities with couplings you can turn on and off between. You, you can do sort of anything you want. The, um, the thing in my mind that's a little different here with superconducting devices than, let's say, with atoms is we can't make them all identical, and we often intentionally don't, and then you have to play special tricks to either tune them or, you know, account for that in your quantum simulation. So, um, you know, I think the sort of neutral atoms, okay, they're still uh, inhomogeneities in the traps and whatnot, but uh, at least the atoms you're starting with are known for healthy identical. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, we are running out of time. Uh, if there's any last questions? Okay, if not, let's give Rob another round of applause. Thanks again. Apologies for having to do it remote. Um, couldn't couldn't see the faces, but I hope we hit the right button. So um, thanks for the invite.